in this Double One Game Creative Video Tutorial series, we'll be looking at the many different types of resources that make up your games, providing a step-by-step -step breakdown on what each of them does and how they can be used to bring your games to life. In this second part, we'll be continuing our look at sprites, learning how to create body and clothing sprites, as well as particle effects. We'll start by taking a look at body sprites. We're going to create a new sprite for our playable character, so we'll need to start with the body first, since that's the base of creating an actor. With the sprite editor open, create a new sprite by clicking on the Add Resource button. Then select Body from the Pick Sprite Template window and click OK. This will pre configure the sprite with the appropriate properties for a body sprite. When creating a new body sprite, two animation layers are created one called Body and Firearm, and the other one called Close Arm. The reason for this is so that the arms are separated from the rest of the body. However, we're going to be using a sprite sheet with the arms attached, so we'll be repurposing the close arm animation layer for something else. By default, the walking pose and right direction will be selected, but we can see that up and down directions have also been created, thanks to these small circles that indicate that at least one sprite animation layer is present. In addition to our walking pose, are slashing and wielding firearm poses that have also been created by our body sprite template. For now though, since we're on the walking right pose, we'll start by importing our walking right animation first. To do this, click on the plus icon for the body and firearm animation layer and select image strip from the drop down menu. You can also choose to insert blank images or image files, but for this video tutorial, we've chosen to use a sprite sheet instead as this will allow us to insert all of the frames of our animation using a single source image. In the description below this video, you'll find a link to a file containing all of the sprite sheets we'll be using in this video tutorial. Download the file to somewhere appropriate on your computer and then return to Double One Game Creator. Click inside the source image box to the left of the Add Image Strip Frames window and select Insert from the drop down menu. Then double click walkright.png from inside the body folder. If you receive a warning about the graphic not being a multiple of two, simply click yes. Depending on the sprite sheet, you may need to adjust the properties to the left to ensure the animation plays correctly. The width and height are the dimensions of a single frame in your sprite sheet, while the columns and rows represent the total number of frames in your sprite sheet. For our sprite sheet, there are eight frames on a single row, so the default values of eight and one are appropriate. Click OK to insert all of the frames into our animation. Next, we need to set up an unaffected layer, a layer that will not be affected by the actor's color. Since we won't be using our close arm animation layer as intended, we'll repurpose it to be our unaffected layer instead. Select the animation layer and rename it to Eyes, and then tick the color unaffected checkbox underneath. Now click on the plus icon for the animation layer and insert another image strip. This time, double click walk right unaffected.png. Once again, everything is set up the way we want it, so we can just press OK to insert the frames into our animation. The reason why we've separated the eyes from the rest of the body sprite is to ensure that they won't be colored in when the body's color is changed. Now let's check to make sure our sprite is positioned correctly in the sequence editor, and also set up its collision box and holding points. To do this, click inside the preview window in the bottom right of the sprite editor, or click on the sequence collision button. The sprite's default position is appropriate for a 45 degree camera view, so we can leave it as is. If this was a platformer with a front facing camera, we'd want to make sure that the sprite's feet sat directly on top of the thicker horizontal line in the center, which represents the floor. But as this is a 45 degree game, it's better to offset it a bit. Since the collision box is a little big, we'll make it smaller by adjusting its Z magnification. Select Rectangle Collision 1 to the left, and then change the Z magnification from 64 to 50. Fortunately, we only have to change this once per pose, as the collision box will appear the same across all directions. Now let's add a holding point to our sprite. A holding point is what tells the blown game creator where a held item should appear when equipped. You can create up to four unique holding points per pose. For now though, we'll just set up a single holding point. Click on the holding point one button at the top 
and then click somewhere within the sequence editor to place it. By default, a golden sword will appear. This will help us to visualize what an item will actually look like when held. You can customize this by clicking on the ellipse button and selecting a different item for holding point one. Before we modify the position of the holding point, we first need to make sure its orientation is set up correctly. To do this, select holding point one from the list to the left, and then change the rotation axis from plus Z to plus Y so that it matches the orientation of our sprite. Then set the Y position to 16 to once again match our sprite. Lastly, set the holding layer to 100 so that it will always render on top of our sprite. If we left it at the default value of 85, the eyes animation layer would actually render on top of the item, which is obviously not what we want. With our holding point now orientated correctly, we can start positioning it. To make this easier, click on the Snap to Grid button to disable grid snapping, which is enabled by default. Then move the holding point over the right hand and adjust the Y rotation slightly so that the sword is pointing slightly forward. Then use the slider at the bottom to move to the next frame and adjust its position so that the sword remains in the sprite's hand. Continue this for all of the remaining frames in the animation. Once finished, you can preview the animation by clicking on the Preview Continuously button to check that everything is looking as it should. Once you're satisfied with your animation, close the sequence editor. Now that we've created our walking right direction, we can set up the down and up directions by repeating these steps. The one exception is the walking left direction, which we can leave blank. The reason being is that Double One Game Creator will automatically flip the right direction if no left direction is specified, and vice versa, so we can save ourselves some time by just focusing on the right, down, and up directions. Diagonal directions will also be flipped automatically if its opposite direction is not specified. Before we move on to clothing sprites, there's two more things we need to do for this sprite and that's to set up its default color and face graphic. To change the sprite's default color, select the button in the body properties section and choose an appropriate color that you like. The face graphic is a 128 by 128 pixel image that will appear whenever the advanced message box event is shown. To insert a new face graphic, simply left click the face graphic box in the top left of the sprite editor and select insert from the drop down menu. Then double click face.png to insert it. Now do the same for the box next to it and select face unaffected.png. This will once again ensure that our character's eyes are not colored with the rest of the body. With our body sprite finished, let's now take a look at clothing sprites. The way in which these are made is very similar to how we created our body sprite. First, click on the add resource button in the top left of the sprite editor to create a new sprite. We're going to create a hair sprite so select Hair from the Pick Sprite Template window and click OK. Like with the Body Sprite template, the Hair Sprite template is already pre-configured for us. You'll notice that the render priority is set to 20 instead of 0. This is to make sure that the Hair Sprite renders on top of the Body Sprite it's associated with. Each clothing layer is given a different render priority so as not to conflict with one another when all of them are layered on top of each other. If two sprites share the same layer, and are overlapping each other, they can appear distorted in what is known as Z-Fighting. Using the animation layer that's created by default, insert an image strip like before and double click walkingright.png from the hair folder. Once again, we can leave the options to the left as they appear by default and click OK. Now repeat these steps for the up and down directions, selecting walkingup.png and walkingdown.png respectively. We don't need to worry about setting up collision boxes or holding points, since these sprites will be layered on top of our body sprite, which already has both of these configured. Next, we'll insert a face graphic by left clicking the box in the top left of the sprite editor and selecting insert from the drop down menu. Then double click face.png from the hair folder to insert the face graphic. Unlike our body sprite, our hair sprite doesn't need an unaffected color face graphic, so we can leave that box blank. However, one thing we shouldn't overlook is the face render layer. Much like the render priority 
for the sprite itself. The face render layer determines the order in which face graphics are stacked on top of each other. By default, this is set to 2, whereas our body sprite has this set to 0. This ensures that the hair's face graphic will appear over the body's face graphic. The last thing we need to do is connect our hair sprite to our body sprite, so that it'll appear as an option in the actor window when our body sprite is chosen. To do this, click on the Edit Connections to Bodies button in the Accessory Properties section. By default, every body sprite within the project will be selected. To set it up so that only our newly created body sprite is compatible with our hair sprite, click the Uncheck All button to unselect all of the body sprites, and then scroll to the bottom of the list and select the body sprite we created earlier. Since we originally created these sprites for our player character, let's see what that looks like. Open the Players and Party Members window, and then click on the Edit Actor button to the right. Then click on the Body Sprite button and select your Body Sprite. Then click on the Hair Sprite button and select your Hair Sprite. Not too shabby. We can repeat these steps for the other clothing layers to fully deck out our player character. Before we wrap up this video tutorial, there's one more thing we want to cover particle effects. These are sprites that are generated based on set parameters, and as such, they can be widely varied from one another. This time, we'll be modifying an existing sprite that comes with the Action RPG template. With the sprite editor open, navigate to the Effects Magic folder and select the Thunderstorm sprite. Untick the Face X option and then select the Particle Generation setting. This will enable the Options button besides it. Click on it to open the Particle Generation window. Starting in the top left, we have the minimum and maximum lifetime. These values determine how long the particle effect stays on screen. Frequency determines the speed in which new particles are created during its lifetime, while limit amount determines how many total instances of the particle effect will appear during its lifetime. If left at zero, it will generate new particles indefinitely. Starting size and starting rotation determine the size and rotation range a particle starts with while size change and rotation change determine how much a particle will scale or rotate during its lifetime. These settings can be used to add lots of variation. Likewise, starting distance x, y, and z, and starting speed x, y, and z, determine the range of position from the center and speed for the particle, while speed change x, y, and z determines how fast or slow the particle will be by the end of its lifetime. Starting color, starting opacity, ending color, and ending opacity can be used to blend colors into others, as well as cause a particle to fade in and out. You can also position particle effects relative to its source to avoid trailing, and have it rotate with the direction it's traveling in. For our thunderstorm particle effect, set the minimum and maximum starting size to 5% and 15% respectively. Then set the maximum starting distance x and y to 64. To preview what our particle effect looks like, Press the Preview Continuously button in the Sprite Editor. By simply changing its starting size and starting distance, we were able to turn this Thunderstorm Sprite into a static discharge. If you need some inspiration, try taking a look at the Fire Explosion, Heal, and Snow Particle effects to see the many different ways you can use particle generation in Double One Game Creator. Now that we know how to create particle effects, the next step is getting them to show up in your games. There are multiple ways you can go about this. You can use them in items and magic as a projectile sprite or a result sprite. You can attach the particle effect to an actor by selecting the Edit Graphic Options button in the actor window and modifying the Attach Sprite section. You can then use the Attach Sprite and Detach Sprite scripting events to modify them in game. You can also place particle effects directly on your map by using the Dynamic Object Actor template or use the Play Sprite scripting event to play a particle effect at a specific point on your map or interface. This concludes the second part of our video tutorial series, detailing the different types of resources used in Double One Game Creator. In the next part, we'll be taking a look at tile sets, providing an overview of the tileset editor itself, as well as learning the differences between ground, lower object, upper object, and wall tiles.